Hey there, my name is Sam Okus. I am the editor-in-chief at Nation's Restaurant News, bringing you a very special edition of the Extra Serving Podcast. That's right, this week we are thrilled to go live with NRN's Top 500 list, giving you a definitive look at restaurant chain performance in 2020. We have partnered with Data Central and its Firefly 500 platform on this year's Top 500, and it is chock full of insights that can help you benchmark your own brand's performance and strategize for the year ahead. But we are not stopping there. To dig in just a little deeper on how brands fared in 2020, right here on the Extra Serving feed, we are going to provide you with an exclusive interview with a brand leader on how they managed to succeed in 2020 and how they're emerging from the pandemic even stronger than before. These snapshots of success give you exclusive access to the winning strategies that are helping restaurant companies navigate uncharted waters and hopefully will provide you with the ideas for tackling challenges you face in your own business. Stay tuned for more snapshots of success in the coming weeks and months ahead as we explore what exactly went right for those brands that closed 2020 with positive stories to tell. So be sure to subscribe to the Extra Serving Podcast on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts, and we will be feeding you with those stories, with those interviews, with executives from some of the top 500 brands. Also, be sure to head to nrn.com to catch up on all of our top 500 coverage, including a robust data package with sales and unit count information for the nation's top 500 chain restaurants. And now, let's roll into today's Snapshots of Success interview from NRN's 2021 Top 500. Hi, this is Joanna Fantosi, Associate Editor with Nation's Restaurant News. For the latest episode of Snapshots of Success from NRN's Top 500 Restaurants Report, we spoke with Andy Wiederhorn, CEO of Fat Brands, the parent company of Fat Burger, about his company's momentum. Hi, I'm Joanna Fantosi, Associate Editor with Nation's Restaurant News, and I'm speaking with Andy Wiederhorn, President and CEO of Fat Brands, about the success of the company and specifically his brand Fat Burger during the pandemic. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, so to get started, uh, what do you think made Fat Burger stand out over the past year? Well, look, Fat Burger is an iconic brand. It's more than 70, almost 75 years old. So people who know Fat Burger know it because I grew up eating Fat Burgers in Los Angeles or wherever Fat Burgers spread around the globe um, in, in that last 75 year period. So, you know, I think the brand awareness is very important. Um, we were a pioneer in delivery and to-go businesses, including all the third party stuff. We did that with Uber Eats when they first launched as, as a trial customer, the first burger brand to launch. And so, you know, we have presence on those delivery platforms that dates back to the beginning of them. And I think that when dining rooms were forced to close and people were forced to stay home, you know, a burger, shake and fries are pretty easy go to once in a while and to have it delivered. People know how to do that. So I think that was really helpful for us. Our delivery sales went from 35% to 85%. Yeah, that's crazy. And in general, your sales really spiked over the past year. So to what do you attribute uh, your strong sales with? Well, I think what's happened, so sales today at, at many of our brands are, are like 120% of where they were, um, 20% greater than 2019 levels, right? And I think that is the combination of an increased awareness of delivery and to-go, and then the dining rooms opening back up. So people are coming back to the restaurants, but also they now have more awareness about, hey, I can get these different brands on the delivery platforms. And so the combination of those two really has boosted sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when another piece of the puzzle in terms of success over the past year is, um, sales uh, is, is a uh, unit growth. So when so many people were closing underperforming units during the pandemic, Fat Burger grew by 18%. Uh, what was your growth strategy there? Well, so we've had very strong franchise sales, um, this year, but last year and the year before they've been very solid. And so those stores that people bought as franchisees to develop were in the pipeline. They continue to open. We opened 62 stores across all of our brands during 2020. We'll open close to that same number in 2021. And right now we've sold more franchises in 2021 in six months than we sold in all of 2020 and 2019 put together. So very, very strong franchise sales. And, and I think really, you know, that, that store opening growth has been consistent in a pipeline that we've worked on you know, very hard the whole time. So it isn't just like we made a pivot in the middle of COVID. It was something that was in process. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and uh, can you, um, uh, so, so a big, a big portion of, uh, of the news that came out of that brand last year was the merger with Bob Cutter Capital. Uh, could you tell me about your overall strategy that led up to that merger in late 2020? You bet. So we bought, Bob Cutter Capital was, was really our, our, almost our family office holding company. And we didn't know quite all of it, but most of it. And about 80%. And so when we bought the Fabregas brand 18 years ago and had 40 restaurants and grew it to now you know, 200 restaurants and a 200 store pipeline to be built out in the coming future. Taking the company public in 2017, we owned 80% of the company, the public owned 20%. And for tax reasons, we had to continue to own at least 80% with a big loss carry forward that we wanted to use to shelter our income. And so by merging the companies together at the end of last year, which is something we had always planned to do, that brings tax loss into fat brands and we and Fogcutter no longer had to be an 80% shareholder. And on that basis, when you don't have to be an 80% shareholder, we can use our stock now to buy people. We can issue more, you know, raise more capital for acquisitions um, by selling more shares. And so it really took all the handcuffs out, off and let us act like a very, you know, a very mature public company. Okay, great. Um, and um so another, um, another big move that you guys made last year, and then we actually, I believe we spoke about it, um, about the acquisition of Johnny Rockets uh, last summer. Um, so since we last spoke, how has that move helped to evolve and grow your portfolio? And how does that fit into kind of your overall strategy? Right, the, the Johnny Rockets acquisition was, was a great transaction for us. It doubled the size of our platform, took us from 350 restaurants to almost 700 restaurants that are open or under construction. Uh, it's been a, a seamless integration of that brand onto our platform with our other brands, our burger brands, our steakhouse brands, the chicken wings brands. So it's gone very well. Um, you know, it's a little dicey in the middle of the pandemic. Before there was a vaccine, many restaurants were closed to make an acquisition of another brand that, you know, is equal in size to all of our other brands together. Half the business is international. It's 335 restaurants. So it was um, a little gutsy, but it turned out to, you know, to be a very, very good acquisition for us. And, and we're very happy with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of going back to Fat Burger specifically, um, how did you lean into technology there? I know that there was some like uh, leaning into ghost kitchens as well. Yeah, two, really two ways. The, the delivery platforms themselves are, are honestly a great technology investment because instead of uh, companies having to maintain their own online ordering apps, which cost fifty or $100,000 every six months to update, and, 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 keep, you know, and to keep them working with, with changes um, to the apps. When you use a third-party delivery company, they're keeping the technology current and all the menus and all those things on, on their system. And so it really makes it more efficient for you to run your business and let the delivery app company keep those things you know, straight. So that was very beneficial. Then the second angle to that is you can also use your own online ordering app to capture customers and save the third-party delivery fees on a regular basis. If you have recurring customers, you know, that's helping the operators make more money, our, our franchisees. And then finally, the ghost kitchens and virtual restaurants, we have three dozen virtual restaurants today, and we're on our way to, to many more of those. And that's where we can sell some of our additional brands out of the back door of our other brands. For example, we can sell some of our chicken wings concepts to go out of the back door of a fat burger or, or um, buffaloes or hurricanes or elevation burger. And that enables those operators to make more money. It doesn't confuse the customer in the restaurant because it's only for delivery and it's going out the back door with different packaging and different ingredients. And that's really a technology play because you're using the delivery apps again to offer more restaurant menus, basically different brands to your customers in your markets and selling them out of one kitchen. Um, and uh, kind of pulling back a little bit to look at uh, success in general, um, what do you think it took to become an industry leader during the pandemic over the past year and change? Well, I think for everyone in the restaurant industry, it's about tenacity and persistence, right? You get knocked down a few stairs, you get back up, you get knocked down the canvas, you get back up, and whatever your, your analogy is, you know, it's very important that you just keep going at it and you try to be creative, you try to be nimble and you pivot your business in directions that you need to. Think about all the outdoor dining spaces that were created by restaurant operators during the pandemic and all the, the personal protective equipment that they had to learn how to wear and teach their employees, educate customers about safety and sanitation and all of that. I think those, those, that resiliency is really, you know, really uh, lends itself to the restaurant industry operator. And, you know, we're just fortunate. Our, our sales have come roaring back. Um, we're in the middle of some acquisitions that I think you'll find very interesting as, as we get through um, the coming months. 
And, and so, you know, I'm really glad to see the industry recovering so rapidly. Mm -hmm. that, sounds, that sounds exciting. Can you give us a sneak peek of that? <laughs> Well, you know, there's we don't we don't there's some brands we don't have, right? We have burger brands, we have steakhouse brands, we have chicken brands. We don't have pizza, salad, coffee, dessert. So we'd like to round out our portfolio. You know, we we um, have, have said repeatedly in the public markets that we're acquisitive right now, and that we hope to announce some acquisitions soon. And so, you know, I'm excited to enter the summer with um, you know on the tail ends of that. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and um, so. Obviously, um, March, March 2020 was super different than, let's say, fall or even for the end of 2020. So how would you say your strategy evolved over the course of the year? Well, it was about coaching our franchisees. We view this business where the franchisee is our customer. So their success is critical because that's who pays us every week, right? It's not really the guy eating the hamburger or the chicken wing. It's the franchisee. So it was critical to make sure they could stay in business. We coached them on getting um, the PPP loans, on the personal protective equipment they needed on and all the supply chain issues they had to deal with if they were closing their dining rooms and just being a partner with those franchisees and constantly keeping them updated and giving them best practices advice and and, and you know really just sort of being there to a shoulder to lean on and, and things like that really helped us and helped you know as a strategy bring us closer to our franchisees in a, in a time that was you know very hard for every operator you know as a franchisor we're not running the restaurants the franchisees are running the restaurants so it's just so important that they had direction and they had resources. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what are the biggest lessons that you learned from some of the challenges over of 2020? Well, again, I, I think it's being nimble and, and being able to pivot your strategy. If something doesn't work, you have to go in a different direction. You know, you have to take price with rising costs. You have to manage your margins at all times. You know, it doesn't do you any good to lose money on a sale. So why make that sale, right? You need to make profitable sales and you need to structure your your uh, menu offerings and make sure that your labor and supply chain and your, you know your margins are there and that's that's critical mm -hmm. um and how would you say uh your strategy has shifted at all um moving forward um and as as we're kind of coming out of this pandemic how has your how has your strategy changed you know we're, we're accelerating rapidly i mean we're, we're taking off in, into outer space here in terms of you know the sales volumes that we're doing the acquisitions we have planned the recovery is very strong and we just want to see our franchisees, you know, get fully recovered, fully open, full dining room capacity and, and all those things happening. So, you know, our, our stock price is up hundred percent, it's up 400% last year. I mean, crazy, crazy numbers, you know, for the restaurant industry, we're not the only one. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that lends itself to the capital markets being positively you know, rewarded here. And that is going to lead to more success for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and finally, I would ask, kind of as, as an industry leader, what, what keeps you up at night? You always worry about foodborne illnesses. You worry about violence in, in, in restaurants or in the parking lot or, you know, all the things you read about every, every morning in the paper and just, you know, knock your head and say, like, how can this be going on? So you worry about those things, of course. You worry about the safety of your employees. You, you know, you, you can't imagine another pandemic. We've, we've had one for 100 years. I think we're all good on that front. So, you know, I, I think it's really specific incidents that you, you worry about the most. The supply chain and the labor shortage are annoying. Those things will go away over time. The stimulus checks will run out. All that stuff will get back to normal. And I really think consumers want to be in restaurants. They want to be in dining rooms. They don't just want to sit at home and have delivery. That, and I think people want to go back to the office. It's great to work at home sometimes, but it's not really the norm. It's not socially very, very comforting either. So I think that you're going to see return to normalcy in, in ways that you really haven't seen in a long time.